Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Heidi Roth. I'm a registered dietitian as well as health coach. And um, today our topic is love your brain. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things. Everyone should, um, looks like everyone's muted, which is wonderful. I'm, uh, I've opened up the chat box. So if you had a question that you wanted to ask, um, please use the chat box to ask the question. And uh, afterwards, I'll, we'll leave some time afterwards for questions as well. Um, and um, we'll get started. So let me just make sure I am recording this. Yes, I am. Um, and also don't use the Q&A for questions while I'm talking, but I will check that after. So let's get started. All right. So. Our topic today is loving your brain. And obviously a healthy brain pretty much determines your life, um, right? It determines our mood, it determines our risk for depression, it determines um, how energetic we are, it determines basically how successful we are. So the more that we can focus on our brain health, the more that, you know, I would argue that your life is going to be a happy, fulfilled, life that you'll be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So just a couple of brain facts. Our, our brain is very soft. It's uh, about 78% water, 12% fat. So mostly fat and water. It's suspended in cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it only makes up 2% of our body weight, but uses 20% of our energy. So your brain, is a highly, highly electrical organ, and it uses so, so much energy. So each side of the brain interacts with the opposite side of the body. That's why when you have a stroke sometimes on one side of the brain, let's say your left side of the brain, it impacts your right side of your body and maybe your right side of your body is, is paralyzed. Uh, what are some causes of brain disease? Uh, inflammation. Inflammation has kind of been suggested to be the root cause of most kind of chronic Western diseases, whether we're talking about cancer, or we're talking about heart disease or autoimmune disease, they all have some sort of inflammation at their root cause. Um, oxidative stress, oxidative stress kind of you can think of as maybe like the resting of your body. Uh, toxins, pollutants, head trauma, aging, genetics, poor nutrition, and then of course, heart and cardiovascular disease. All of these things contribute um, to potentially some brain disease. But we're going to be focusing on the positive things today. And we're gonna be focusing on how we can keep our brain healthy. And there's six different things that I wanted to talk about. So number one would be protecting our brain, um, managing stress, getting enough sleep, exercise, good diet and challenging it. So let's start first with protecting your brain. This is one of the biggest things that you can do for your brain is to protect it. Um, when you get a head injury, it impacts so many different areas of your life, your mood, your cognition, your emotions, your behaviors, all of these things, even mild brain injuries can, can you know, dis disrupt your good brain health. Um, as I had said before, your brain is mostly fat and water. So imagine taking like a bowl of jello or like a big handful of jello or a big handful of custard, you know, kind of jiggly and soft. That that's kind of what your brain looks like. Now imagine throwing that against some rocks. Obviously the jello against hard rocks it's not gonna fare very well, right? It's, it's gonna get damaged. Um, and not, you know, to some extent, our brain is the same way. The inside of our brain, our skull is a very hard, it's not super soft. Um, and when we get any sort of head injury and our brain hits potentially our hard skull, you can get, cause a lot of damage to your brain. So what does that mean? It means that when we're doing any sort of exercise, really prioritizing our brain health. Yeah, you know, maybe you go out for a quick bike ride and maybe it doesn't always look cool to wear a helmet or whatever, um, put your helmet on. Um, you know, and just, you go up to, into your attic, 
And we, our attic has all these rafters and, you know, so many times, I can't tell you how many people I've heard of, like giving themselves a brain injury by hitting their head in the attic. Um, my son actually um, gave himself a concussion getting into the car. You know how teenagers are. They don't always kind of know how tall they are. And he was running to go get into the car and whacked his head against the door. Didn't quite, you know, realize the, the height difference that, that he needed. Um, and he gave himself a serious concussion. And, you know, out of, out of all, you know, this is a kid who skied, who played sports. And we're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you gave yourself a concussion with the car, but just really prioritizing um, protecting your brain. So principle number two would be to manage stress. And we don't always think of stress as having a huge impact on our brain. Maybe we think of it as, um, having an impact on our heart, right? It can lead to heart disease. Maybe stress has an impact on our gut, right? There's a big brain gut connection and maybe we get a lot of stomach aches when we're stressed. But chronic stress, that stress where we're just always, always feeling like we're living at 75% of car crash at, at all times, that can constrict your blood flow to your brain. And it actually can kill cells in the memory center of your brain. Maybe think back to the times in your life where you've been really, really stressed. And did you have a hard time remembering things? Were you all that creative, right? Uh, did you have a hard time sleeping? And stress can do this. So the more that we can manage stress, and you know, stress comes and goes in our life, right? Um, there, there's always going to be some times that we're more stressed than others. But recognizing when we are stressed and doing what we can to manage it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about killing the ants, um, but I wanted to focus first on gratitude journal and meditation. I would love to hear in the chat box, does anyone do any sort of meditation? Does anyone use a gratitude journal? I'm seeing, yes, okay, great. Um, so the meditation can literally change your brain. I'm um, seeing another person here, um, meditation, meditation. This is wonderful, lots of people meditating. Um, and what meditating really does is it helps you to live in the moment, right? When we kind of are in the present moment and we can train ourselves to focus on the now, it prevents us from looking backwards, right? And saying, oh, if only I had done this, if only I had done that, that can lead to depression. Now, living in the future and always worrying about the future and kind of that doom scrolling through our mind of everything that could go wrong, that leads to anxiety, right? So living in the past is depression. Living in the future can be anxiety. The more that we can kind of focus on the present and train ourselves to, to live right now, which is what meditation does, is um, you know being mindful in the present moment uh, can help prevent a lot of that stress and anxiety. Uh, I'm seeing also some people journaling here and Calm. I'm guessing that's the app, Calm, um, for meditation. Now, gratitude journal also can be extremely helpful as well, because as humans, we have evolved to always pay attention to what's going wrong in our lives. And it has done very well for us, right? We clearly need to pay attention to the risks, to the danger that's out there. But when we're always kind of looking around for what's going wrong, we, we tend to forget what's going right in our lives. And by taking that time to focus and, and having that gratitude can go a long way towards managing stress. And, you know, if you, if you can't, you know, maybe find anything to be grateful for, maybe just think of some things, um, if they weren't in your life, how would you feel if they weren't in your life? Whether it's your loved ones, your family members, your job, your, your house, you know, your pet, what, whatever it is, it always, your health, it, it always um, can help you find something to be grateful for. Um, some of the benefits of mindfulness meditation, and it looks like a lot of people are doing this already, 
So um, maybe we won't necessarily take up time with doing a, a guided meditation, but just there's, there's so many apps out there that are good for meditation, Calm, Insight Timer, Headspace, um, those are three of my favorite ones. I don't know if anyone else has any others that are favorites. Uh, they used to have so much free stuff on them when they first came out. I know they're all kind of charging here and there a little bit, um, but it's definitely, it's nice to have it as a tool in your toolbox, right? For when you get stressed. And as I had mentioned before, mindfulness meditation can actually change your brain. You know, people have for so long kind of said, oh, you know, that's what hippies do, or that's, you know, some sort of new religion. And, you know, you know, I'm not going to do it. But as soon as they were able to prove on functional MRIs that people who meditated actually were able to have larger areas of the brain associated with learning and memory and empathy, and the areas of the brain associated with anxiety and stress actually shrunk. Um, when they were able to do that, then it kind of brought it out of that kind of crystal hippy dippy world into, oh my goodness, this is science. And so there's a lot of really great science before, behind meditation. Um, and I know meditation isn't necessarily for everyone and it's just one thing that you can try. And for some people it works great. And I would also say, if you're new to meditation, don't expect that you're gonna sit down for 20 minutes and that your mind's never gonna wander. And you know, in the first two minutes, your mind wanders and you say, oh, I failed. Um, no, that's, meditation is really all about recognizing when your mind wanders and being able to bring it back. And so starting with smaller, you know, two or three or five minute meditations is a really great way to start. Um, it's kind of hard to start with like a 20 minute meditation if you're a, a beginner. So that would be one of my um, suggestions. All right, I'm seeing a question here. Somebody is asking, what are ants? Um, anyone ever heard that term before? Anyone know what ants are? Uh, not seeing anything. So ants are automatic negative thoughts. And they can really be damaging to your brain. Automatic negative thoughts are these things that kind of that, that tape that plays all day long in your brain sometimes when we're stressed about something and when we're worried about something, right? Have you ever had that? We're just, just all day long, you can't stop thinking about something. Um, and hopefully, you know, maybe it's just one day, but what if it's a situation in your life that maybe isn't gonna get better anytime soon, or, or maybe you just need to find a different way to think about it, right? And that's, that's where cognitive restructuring comes in. And basically it's this thought of you are what you think. And we tend to believe everything that we think. If we think a thought, we just must be true. We never really challenge ourselves to think, is there a different way to think about this? And so with those automatic negative thoughts, when we find ourselves on that scrolling of always, you know, thinking of the worst case scenario, stop, breathe, reflect, and choose um, is a really, really great way to, to kind of get rid of those automatic negative thoughts. I'll give you a quick story in my life. Um, when my children were little, my husband had a really incredibly stressful job and he loves to sing. And so he said, you know what? I really want to sing for the Boston Symphony or Orchestra. They have, if you've ever been to the Boston Pops, they have, you know, the, the singers in the background. And he said, I really want to try out for that. I want to do that. I said, great, that's wonderful. So he tried out for it. He made it. Everyone said, oh, you know, that's wonderful. And I kind of was happy, but was having a hard time with it because guess what? We had like a four-year-old and a two-year-old at home. And when you sing with the BSO, there's a lot of practices. There's a lot of um, performances. And so I was having a lot of automatic negative thoughts. Oh, he's gone again. I'm stuck with the kids. It's not fair, you know, this and that. And I, you know, didn't want him not to do it. This was a really amazing Thing for him to do, but 
I had a lot of automatic negative thoughts. You know, maybe, maybe you've, you know, maybe in your partnership with your spouse or partner have had sometimes occasional automatic negative thoughts about things like this too. And so I realized this is really putting a strain on our marriage because I'm feeling very resentful all the time. Even though I really want this for him, I'm still feeling resentful. So I need to stop these automatic negative thoughts. I need to stop when, when I you know, am thinking them, stop, take a deep breath. It automatically kind of hits the reset button when you hit it, when you take a deep breath and then reflect hey, you know, I really want him to be able to do this. This is an amazing opportunity. I'm going to choose to think about this in a different way. I'm going to choose to think, well, with the times where he's gone for a rehearsal, instead of having to cook a family dinner, let's do something fun with the kids. Maybe we'll have pizza night and we'll watch a movie. We'll have a picnic in front of the fireplace. We'll go out for ice cream. Um, we'll all go meet my girlfriends whose husbands travel all the time and we'll go to the Mexican restaurant and have a margarita while the kids run around, you know, in the basement. And um, so I chose to think about the situation differently. I may have overshot it a little bit because um, it actually got to the point where the kids are like, oh, dad's home. <laughs> We're not doing anything super fun tonight. <laughs> So, um, but think about in your own lives, is there a situation, and they're not always carefree situations like that. We all have situations that are maybe much more serious and much, you know, uh, um, you know, maybe uh, it's a little harder to stop, breathe, and reflect, and choose. But the more that you can find time to do that, the, the better um, you're going to feel. And then, of course, scheduling worry time. This is basically just kind of taking a little vacation from your worries. Maybe you take some, some time during a certain time every day that you're going to just catastrophize everything and think about the worst case scenario. But then the rest of the day, you think, no, you know what? It's not my worry time, so I'm not going to do this. This, even though it sounds silly, can be really, really helpful. Does anyone do this? Does anyone kind of like schedule that worry time and then not allow themselves to think about it otherwise? Um, it, it can be very helpful. And then of course, nurturing yourself, you know, that journaling, I saw somebody else journaled, um, taking time for that creativity and leisure, you know, like my husband where he was in that incredibly stressful job, Taking that time to do something that you love that makes that makes you so happy um, is is kind of really important. All right, so principle number three of brain health would be getting enough sleep, and we've all heard this. We know the importance of sleep, but when we think about sleep and our brain health, they are so connected. When we sleep our brain cells are rejuvenated as well. Those synapses become stronger between our brain cells. That's when a lot of our memories are stored. Um, you know, it, a lot of times with people that are studying for exams, you know, they really say it's almost better to get some sleep than it is to pull an all-nighter because you're, you're really going to cement some of those memories. Um, getting seven to eight hours per night is recommended. Now, a couple of years ago in 2013, um, scientists discovered something called the glymphatic system. And you, you maybe have heard of the lymphatic system, which is a system that kind of runs through our body with, um, you know, uh, but the glymphatic system is basically every night we kind of get brainwashed. And it sounds kind of crazy, right? How do we get brainwashed every night? Well, so what happens is, Sorry, I'm just gonna try and pull my, can't see my chats anymore. Um, okay, here we go. So every night as we're sleeping, um, we think of it as like a, a dishwasher, right? That rhythmic, if you ever, ever listen to your dishwasher, you can hear the water swishing over the dishes. The same thing happens in your brain. Every night while you're asleep, you get kind of these rhythmic waves of this glymphatic fluid that, that um, washes over your brain, washes out all the toxins, washes out you know, some of those damaging type of proteins that can lead to dementia and Alzheimer's. And so when we sleep, 
we get brainwashed and our, our brain gets clean too. And when that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen on a regular basis and for enough time, that actually predisposes us to things like, um, you know, different types of dementia, including Alzheimer's. So another reason why sleep is so incredibly important. So when we talk about sleep, we talk about something called sleep hygiene. I know it's kind of a weird term, but that's all the things that we can do to help our, ourselves get the best night's sleep and sleep really soundly seven to eight hours every night. So number one would be maintaining a regular sleep schedule. So instead of going to bed at 1030 during the week and then at one o'clock on the weekends, and you know, we're all guilty of that every once in a while, but as much as possible, try to maintain the same sleep schedule within about half an hour each night. Um, using the bedroom and bed for only for sleep, for intimacy, for meditation. Because we tend to um, respond very, very much to cues. All, almost, you, you think of Pavlov's dog and the bell ringing and they start salivating. We are the same way. We associate different things with different rooms in our house. For example, we think of our kitchen as the place where we eat. So anytime you walk into your kitchen, maybe you sometimes think, oh, a snack would be nice, or what, what is there to munch on? And maybe you weren't hungry before, but as soon as you walk into your kitchen, you think, oh, that would be nice. Well, you wanna be able to walk into your bedroom and think, oh, it's time for sleep. But if you do all kinds of other things in your bedroom, including maybe you're, you know, doing work in your bedroom and emails and, and, you know, whatnot, sometimes our brain gets a little confused and doesn't always associate our bed with, with sleep. So you want that association to be really strong. Um, a dark bedroom is really, really important for helping to, to set our circadian rhythm, for helping your body to produce melatonin. Um, avoiding caffeine after 4 p.m., and this is really just, this is for the fast metabolizers of caffeine. Uh, people metabolize caffeine at different rates and a lot of it is genetic. But if you are someone who, you know, is a slow metabolizer and caffeine stays around in your system for a long time, obviously you would wanna make this a lot earlier. Um, I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine, so I can basically drink a cup of coffee and go straight to, to sleep. But I have wondered, you know, am I really getting the best sleep that I can? And so I've really tried to cut that out. Uh, spending time outdoors, especially in the morning. And this is important also, once again, going back to your circadian rhythm, is that when you are outside and get that bright light first thing in the morning, it helps your body to produce melatonin later at night. It helps to set your circadian rhythm. And because of that, um, that's, you know, a, a great thing to do. We might think, oh, you know, my house is pretty bright, um, but going outside, you get 10 times, actually not 10 times, I, I believe the last I heard was seven times the amount of light outside than you do inside. So um, that's, that's an important thing to do. So principle number four would be to exercise. And uh, this is a quote from um, John Rady, who is, he does a lot of work with ADD, um, ADHD, and uh, he's written several books. He's actually located uh, right here in the Boston area in Cambridge. And he says, the point of exercise is to build and condition the brain, building muscles and conditioning the heart are side effects. So being physically active, we can kind of think of that as like a 401k for your brain. We always think of 401k, you know, obviously that we're saving up for our retirement. But the more that we exercise, we actually, there's some research that suggests that we can kind of build some new brain cells. You know, I, I believe it's him that says, um, exercise is miracle grow for your brain. And so like our 401k, when you retire and you start to take money out, if you've built up a healthy retirement, when you take a little bit out, you don't really notice all that much and you still have plenty of money and you go on with your life as you've always lived it. Um, and our brain is the same way. When we start to get older, we start to we're all going to lose brain cells. But the more that you've built up these brain cells and the bigger your brain cell bank is, for lack of a better word, when you start losing brain cells, 
you're just gonna go on as you were before because you're not gonna notice it so much. If you haven't built those brain cells up, guess what? You start losing some and you're going to notice it a lot more. So, you know, the, as I had mentioned, exercise is um, miracle growth for your brain. You actually produce this protein called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and it's, it helps to build up those brain cells. Um, it can reverse the detrimental effects of stress. We had talked about how bad stress is for your sleep. Um, it can help with depression. In fact, exercises can be as effective as a low dose antidepressant. Uh, it improves learning, um, builds body and self-esteem. And, and of course, then all of the other physical things that come along with it in just in terms of your you know, your cardiovascular health, preventing cancer, preventing diabetes, all of those things um, that come along with exercise. Okay, and then principle number five. So as a health coach and dietitian, um, as a dietitian, I might argue that this is maybe one of the most important things that we can do for our brain. And you really are what you eat. Um, and we'll talk about that, especially when we talk about fats. But number one, we had mentioned that your brain is a lot of fat and water. And so our brain is actually very sensitive to um, what's called hypohydration. So it's not dehydration. And of course, dehydration is going to affect our brain. But even just being mildly kind of underhydrated can make us feel a little tired, can make us feel a little sluggish, maybe not our brain not performing at its peak. So making sure that we're drinking adequate amounts of water, um, you know, and hydration can also come from, from other things. It can come from green tea, it can come from coffee. There's some suggestion that both of, the, of those things are very good for our brain health. Um, it can come from soups, from fruits and vegetables. So we don't necessarily have to like be guzzling eight cups of water every day on top of all the other things that you know we're eating and drinking on top of it. So if you're not guzzling eight cups of water a day, don't feel guilty. And there's a lot of other things that I maybe want you to focus on. Um, basically just making sure that, you're, that you are getting some water and making sure that when you're going to the bathroom that your pee is fairly you know, light straw colored. Um, that's, that's what you're looking for. Uh, watching, of course, the calories of the things that you drink, really, you know, any excess calories that you don't want to be, sport, be stored as body fat, which is associated with inflammation, more toxins stored, hypertension, you know, all those other things that maybe wouldn't be so good for your brain. Um, you know, and then when it comes to your diet, think of your brain as a race car. So I have a 17 year old son and uh, you know, I, I do hear a bit here and there about race cars. <laughs> so they're on my mind. Um, but as I've been instructed that when you have a race car, you need to put in high octane fuel. You need to put in the really good quality fuel because you want that car to perform at its best. If you put in the junk fuel, the cheap fuel, guess what happens? The car pings and you're not going to get the same, um, you know, oomph and power and whatever if you're putting in the really low octane fuel. And so we really need to kind of, and it's a really great example for us because our brain is, you know, we want it to function like a Lamborghini, right? And so we need to give it the high quality fuel, not necessarily expensive, high quality fuel. So a lot of these things don't always have to be super expensive. Things like beans and legumes and cabbage and leafy greens and kale and collard greens, you know, those are all amazingly healthy for your brain um, and not crazy expensive. You know, some of, sometimes some of these things are, but all of these foods here, these bright, beautiful rainbow foods all provide different types of antioxidant and oxidants and different nutrients for your brain, helping to prevent that oxidative stress, helping to prevent that inflammation that can be damaging to our brain. Um, unfortunately, the standard American diet is low octane fuel. This is kind of the junk fuel, right? And appropriately enough, the standard American diet acronym is SAD. 
Um, there's, there's been a lot of research lately on something called nutritional psychiatry and this thought that what we eat has a huge impact on our mental health in terms of our risk for depression and anxiety. And so these foods, you know, study after study really just shows that they're, they're really not, not good for our brain. Um, so trying to minimize these as much as much as we can. Of course, we want some good fats. As I had mentioned, your brain is mostly fat and water. And the type of fat that we eat actually impacts the type of fat that you'll find in your brain. Um, specifically, when we talk about omega-3 fatty acids, if you have a diet that's deficient in these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, you, if, if they were to do a brain biopsy, they would discover that you don't, that you don't have as many as other people would. So you actually kind of incorporate them into your brain. Um, and if you have a deficiency in these, some studies suggest that your brain is actually going to be a smaller volume than people that are getting adequate amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. So before we talk about those, some other good types of fats would be any type of vitamin E containing foods. Vitamin E is really um, great for your brain. So things like almonds, peanuts, wheat germ, avocados, shrimp, all of these things are really great sources of vitamin E. Um, really any type of nut or seed contains some, some little bit of vitamin E. Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil is great for helping to um, decrease inflammation and, you know, inflammation can be damaging to your brain. And then of course the omega-3 fatty acids. Where do you find omega-3 fatty acids? You find them in fatty type of fish. So herring, salmon, mackerel, sardines, all of those types of fish are really amazing sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but, you know, honestly, eating more seafood in general, you've probably heard your mom say, oh, eat, eat the seafood, it's brain food, right? And, and studies really support this. Why? Because a lot of seafood does have these omega-3 fatty acids, and some, some are better sources than others. Um, and they also contain things like zinc, selenium, B12, and these minerals and, and that B12 vitamin are essential for your for your brain health. Now, of course, you know for those that are um, 100 plant based, you can have some ALA, which is a different type of omega three. Your body then has to convert it into the EPA and DHA. Those are the kind of the more the, the, the forms that our body uses. But um, you know, so if you are 100 plant based, you can get some omega threes from leafy greens from flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds. Not all nuts are really good sources of omega-3s. It's really only the walnuts in particular that are the best source of omega-3s. Nuts, of course, have very, you know, a really great source of fat, but um, when we're looking for omega-3s, you really wanna look for walnuts. And of course, what does a walnut look like? Um, it looks like a brain, right? And so that's nature's way of telling you uh, eat more walnuts. They're good for your brain. They have lots of omega-3 fatty acids. And then when, when it comes to carbohydrates, you know, really kind of being picky about the type of carbohydrates that, that we are eating. Ideally, when we're eating carbohydrates, you want it to be a low glycemic carbohydrate. So something like, um, you know, sweet potatoes or beans or whole grains in terms of like the entire whole grain. So not necessarily something made with whole wheat flour, but actually the whole wheat kernel in the form of wheat berries or farro. Um, quinoa would also be another whole grain that would be good. And then of course, fruits and vegetables, we had talked about all the benefits of those. Specifically though, berries and green leafy vegetables. When we're looking to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia, there's um, a, a lot of study done on a diet called the MIND diet. And the MIND diet is basically a Mediterranean diet, but they also focus extensively on adding berries in and green leafy vegetables. And it's been shown to really be very effective at um, helping to prevent dementia. Adding in some fermented foods. Fermented foods are very good for your gut bacteria. And there definitely is a link between our gut bacteria and our brain. Our gut bacteria talks to our brain. 
all day long. So um, the happier your little gut microbes are, the potentially the happier you're going to be. So adding in some fermented foods is always a good, good thing to do. Spices. We don't always think of spices in brain health. But once again, so much research on a lot of these spices, we've probably all heard of turmeric, right? A lot of people are taking turmeric supplements. Um, mixing that with black pepper really makes it much more effective. Saffron hasn't really gotten a lot of press, but saffron can be very helpful, not only for helping sleep, um, it can actually help potentially improve focus and attention um, and maybe depression too. So saffron, probably is, uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Rosemary, sage, you know, when we talk about sages, we're talking about a really wise person, right? And so here we go, here's the herb that can help you be really wise. Um, and then of course, all of these passion flower, chamomile can be helpful with sleep. And then last principle is number six, challenging your brain. And studies show that keeping your brain challenged and engaged can help prevent Alzheimer's disease, can, dementia. Um, so we're looking for variety and novelty, especially. Um, you know, if you're doing the same kind of crossword puzzle all day long and you're not really trying to learn a new skill, it's not as good as maybe trying to learn a new language or learn a piano, learn an instrument. Um, that's actually kind of better. And then of course, active social life. Um, I think probably maybe you've heard the headlines that loneliness can be maybe as damaging to your heart as smoking. I don't know if anyone's seen some of those. So uh, loneliness is, is, can be um, you know, very damaging. So the, the, the more active and social you are, we're just coming out of a pandemic. So um, now we can finally kind of start socializing again. And then, as I'd mentioned, challenge some other things to challenge your brain, you know, doing something with your hands, um, strengthening your memory. There's something called Brain HQ, which is kind of fun. My mother does this and it compares you to other people of your age. So if you're kind of curious where you stand, what percentile. Um, video games, surprisingly enough, can be actually good for your brain, learning a new video game. Um, TV is very passive, so that's not necessarily good for your brain. Um, so those are our six things that we had talked about. So we talked about protecting your brain. We talked about managing stress, getting enough sleep, exercise, good diet, and then challenging your brain. Um, and so that is it. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, any questions, comments? Um, happy to answer those as well. Actually, I'm gonna stop my share here. And, I have a question, um, Heidi. Yeah. Hi, Amy. What What is kimchi? Oh, kimchi is Korean um, fermented cabbage, and it's mm. spicy and garlicky and delicious. So would you just eat it out of the thing. Um. Typically, I would put it like if I had a rice dish, I would put it along in the rice dish. Um. I actually. <laughs> one of the things I like to do is I, I like to take a lettuce leaf, put a canned yeah. sardine on it, and then put some kimchi on it and roll it up. And it sounds really weird, but you know what? You're getting your leafy green, you're getting your omega-3s and your fermented vegetable all in one little snack or meal. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's one of the things I like to do with it. But if you, I've, I've seen a lot of recipes for like kimchi soup and stuff like that. And that's not as good as eating it raw. So, and when you heat it, you do kill some of the bacteria. It's still very, very healthy, but um, you do kill some of the bacteria. So it's, yeah, I would, I would definitely try it. it just a little dab, you can put it on sandwiches. Um, you know, if you're making a wrap, you can put it in there, maybe with some eggs, you know, different people like different things. Okay. I was snacking on almonds. Oh, yay. <laughs> Thank you. Some source of vitamin E. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm just going to look. I don't see. We had, We don't have any Q&As. I don't see. Um, any other questions? Um, we talked about a lot of different things today. And so I would say don't feel overwhelmed. 
maybe just pick one or two things that we talked about and think about how you can incorporate it, right? Um, all right, so is there a way to measure brain health? Hmm, that is a good question. Well, there is, there's a technical way to measure brain health. You can do an MRI of the brain and you can see how big your brain is, the brain volume. You can do um, what I believe it, it's um, some other scans. I don't know if I forget if it's a PET scan, um, but there's different scans that you can do of your brain to let you know what your brain health is. If you're interested in some of those, there's a book called um, Dr. Daniel Amen and um, is the author. He's a, um, I don't know if he's a researcher or, I know he's definitely a psychiatrist, but I forget what the rest of his background is. Anyway, he literally has done thousands and th thousands of scans. Um, so his name is Dr. Daniel Amen. Uh, so I would, I would look him up and just, you know, maybe get one of his books. They're really great books. Um, but in general, without getting an expensive scan, um, I would say if you're not anxious and you're overall happy and you're overall not stressed and you're able to focus and concentrate when you need to and you're sleeping well, um, I would say that those would be kind of a really, you know, low, you know, um, tech way of knowing to some extent your brain health. Um, but yes, there are different scans that can be done. So, all right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me here today. And um, it was uh, nice, nice to see you all. So thanks for joining me. <laughs>